Hi, everyone. It's uh, December 4th, uh, 2023. This is, um, I think it's the fourth class on uh, Rev Zellman Baumberger. Thank you all for coming. Um, unfortunately, I was not here last week because uh, my uh, mother-in-law passed away and um, I was down in Florida. I mentioned that some of you uh, have traveled with us uh, know my uh, wife. So uh, I'm happy to let you know this information. Uh, so, you know, I know it's always strange. You meet people you, months or years later and you don't even realize that uh, someone passed away. And actually, I'll just raise it only because uh, a very interesting halakhic issue came up. Something that, uh, I mean, it's not a, actually uncommon, I don't think. And uh Yet, yet, I looked in the standard halakhic sources. I couldn't find the answer to this. Uh, I don't have the big art scroll book on Avelos, but I have other books. I looked online. Uh, there's a number of ra contemporary rabbis who discuss it, but no one cites any sources. And here was the question. My wife was an Onain on Friday. So uh, do you make a bracha for uh, Shabbos candles? Um some rabbis were of the opinion that uh, I, I called a number of rabbis also that, yes, she does because it's connected to Shabbos. Others told me no, that she shouldn't. And uh, one person told me that I should make the bracha. Um, I asked uh, Rabbi Lokich, who's I don't know if he's with us now. He's with us often from um, Distinguished Rabbi in Detroit, and he asked a number of, uh, he thought she should, and he asked a number of the rabbis in Detroit, and uh, I'll tell you what they said. Again, this is not so uncommon that uh, you'd think that there'd be a standard uh, view on this. Uh, Rav Asher Eisenberg, uh, post in Detroit, says the bracha should be recited. Also, Rav Daniel Neustadt, Neustadt, um, but Rav Neustadt says, only if the woman is lighting the standard time. If she's lighting before, I don't know, what's the standard time? 18 minutes, any time from 18 minutes till sunset? I don't know what, uh, let's say you're writing 20 minutes before. It's not that standard time. Uh, uh, let's say if Shabbos starts, if sunset is 8.15 and you make Shabbos at 7, I guess that's not standard time. But I don't know what the um, what the actual uh, number would be uh, for standard time. And um, he says that Rav Shmuel Irons, that's where Savitsky's son-in-law also says the woman should write a, write a bracha. And from what I saw online, most people have that because they, the position because they assume it's connected to Shabbos. But then Rabbi Lokich flipped the question. Let's say the wife, let's say there is no wife and the man is an owning. Rav Eisenberg says no bracha. Rav Neustadt, sa Neustadt says yes bracha. And Rav Iron says if he's makabal Shabbos with the lighting, he makes the bracha. And generally, men who, who light candles are not Makabal Shabbos then. So if he's not Makabal Shabbos then, if he's Makabal Shabbos later in Shul, he doesn't make the bracha. So we have a little bit of machokis. But just here's an example of something that I don't think is so uncommon, and there doesn't seem to be absolute uh, uniformity. I um, I did a little uh, reading um, we spoke about the hospital last class. You know, this is one of the big issues. Uh, if the uh, Orthodox remain part of the general community, then the hospital can be kosher, all the things that you'd expect uh, uh, to be in a, if it's a, a traditional run institution. And uh, there was an old age home. Uh, it's a big community. They had all sorts of institutions. Um, what I didn't know when I learned from this article is that the Auschwitzgemeinde, the Hersheyan community, the IRG, uh, they had a hospital also. Um, it was called Rothschild's Hospital. It was established in 1850, and um, it uh, continued uh, to 1941 when the Nazis closed it. Uh, uh, so that I did not know. One more thing before we begin. We have good stuff today. Uh, um a couple of you wrote to me, you found it strange about Rabbi Bomberger in the dispute. And we're going to see the dispute. We saw some bitterness in the dispute. We'll see more bitterness. But how Rabbi Bomberger tries to shut down the dispute by saying that uh, he's the authority and uh, he can pask in this. And remember, Hish was saying to him that uh, I'm the Chacham of the community. I gave Psak. Who are you? And remember, there's no other rabbi then at the community official rabbi. It's not like there's two communities. There's the there's uh, the general community, but they don't have the rabbi. 
And then there's the uh, separatist community. And for you, Bomberger, to come in and contradict me, that's not allowed. And Bomberger said that generally you're correct. However, that applies when the rabbis are of equal standing. But I'm, but when one of the rabbis is greater, then he can. And uh, so I understandably, it's a little bit surprising that uh, a god of Israel is pulling rank this way. It reminds me perhaps the famous story of Fesco Abramsky. I don't know if it's apocryphal or not, but he was on in a trial. He was called as a witness. And uh, the um, the lawyer said something to him like, is it true, uh, Rabbi Abramsky, that you're the greatest Talmudic authority in the United Kingdom? And he replied, yes. And the judge said to him, Rabbi Abramsky, isn't a rabbi supposed to be humble? And he said, yes, indeed, but I'm under oath. So I have to tell the truth. Uh, if it's a dispute, and uh, a lot hung on that dispute, uh, and Rabbi Bomberger is being, uh, Hirsch is puzzling Rabbi Bomberger, saying that his opinion is invalid because he's uh, he's contradicting the local rabbi. I, I guess uh, if the only way to save his opinion is to say that really uh, we're not equal, uh, that uh, I'm uh, regarded as greater than you, and uh, your greatness, Hirsch, is not known to be in Talmud, Shas, and Poskim. And this is a fundamentally a halachic issue, and therefore... Uh, I'm not bound by you. Uh, you know, I have to say, and uh, some of you are going to be happy with me saying this. Others are going to be uh, very upset that I'd say this. And others uh, are going to say that uh, I just should have kept out of it, not put my uh, head in there, you know, when when great, you know, stick your head among the great mountains. Uh, but I'm, I, you, you pay me, you pay me to be here, not that you pay me, but uh, I'm here to give my opinion. And I have to say that in reading the halachic back and forth, uh, I'm talking about the halachic here, not the general hashkafa. I have to say, with all due respect to Rabbi Lomberger, that I think Hirsch comes out on top. I mean, if you read the arguments back and forth, uh, I, who am I to make this judgment? Okay, I'm no, I'm a puny compared to these two giants. But in my opinion, in reading them, even though Bomberger is the Gadol Hador in Germany, and he's the recognized, you know, leader of Torah Judaism from a in a rabbinic sense, halachic sense, I should say, I think Hirsch comes out on top in the argument. If you look at the argument back and forth, uh, now it is true that remember Bomberger gives his decision. Hirsch comes out with his attack on Bomberger. Bomberger comes out with his defense of his decision and his attack on Hirsch. And then Hirsch comes out with a lengthy attack on Bomberger, and Bomberger doesn't reply. And his son says that he he, he didn't want to uh, create more dispute, more mahogas. He said his point, and that's that. Now, it could be that had Bomberger replied to Hirsch, then I would be saying, no, Bomberger comes out on top. We have a tendency to be led by the last uh, position we see, uh, or the last argument we see, and grant it uh, more validity. Having said that, though, since Bomberger didn't reply, I don't have anything to go by. I'm just looking at what uh, Hirsch says, what Bamberger's reply, and Hirsch's reply, and it seems lefi anius daiti, in my humble opinion, that um, Hirsch, from a halachic standpoint, leaving aside the hashkafa, which I'm much more sympathetic to Bamberger, just from a pure, if you're turning this into a pure halachic argument, it appears to me at least that Bamberger comes out on top, not all the arguments, but uh, in many of them. I want to now. Uh, um, introduce you to something that uh, is not, is halachic, but is also hashkafic, and uh, it's an important point, also a great dispute between the two. Uh, as I'm calling this up, I just see, well, I'll get to the comments later, but I think, uh, I think already, I'm going to write down Morty um, <laughs> for what he says. Okay. Um, uh, okay. What am I want to introduce yourself to? Well, here's makes a big deal about the fact that the 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 general community he calls it the community of minus of the of reformist community the heretical community namely the larger community uh, and therefore we can't have anything to do with them um bomberger is going to make an interesting argument that let me uh, introduce it to you now actually before getting to this i just i reminded i wanted to say one more thing that um if you recall i told you that um Bomberger comes to Frankfurt and he meets with um, 
Rabbi Moshe Mainz, who's a, a business person, but it, he considers him a great Tamachacham, and Mainz convinces him that there's 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 no need to separate. Since if the since the Frankfurt community, the general community, is going to uh, give the mon give the Orthodox everything they want, they can build a new shul, hire a rabbi, build a mikvah, everything they want. Moshe Mainz, I didn't mention this last class. He actually was a member of Hirsch's community. And like everyone, he was a member of Hirsch's community as well as the larger community. But there were Orthodox Jews who were not members of Hirsch's community. They were only a member of the uh, the general community. Mainz was a member of both communities. And nevertheless, he refuses to accept Hirsch, what the rabbi says. Uh, Moshe Mainz was older than Hirsch, was a Tamachachim in his own right, and uh, uh, he didn't feel bound uh, by Hirsch. Now, uh, it could be that the Mainz joined the Hirschian community just to show support for it. After all, this is a community of people who at great financial sacrifice are paying double taxation and are creating a community just controlled by the Orthodox uh, uh, it could be that uh, Rabbi Moshe Mind simply thought that that was a great Kiddush Hashem, and he wanted to join and be part of it without giving up any of his autonomy. He's an, he, after all, he's just paying um, membership, and he could maybe go daven there. Uh, I don't know where he daven on Shabbos, but he was, in fact, he paid membership. I think we can also say, however, that he was not a um, he was not a Hershey. <laughs> Even though there are many people in the in the separatist community uh, who were not. Full Hirschians. Wait till I give you the numbers later. Uh, Hirsch had great successes in Germany. Turim der Heretz, enormous success. This dispute, he ends up, it's a big failure. And you know, what I mean by failure, I'll read you later the numbers, the numbers of his own community that went along with him. Uh, but before we get to that, I want to call your attention to something else. And that's the Rambam here in Hilchos Chuva, because uh, Hirsch and Bamberger have a dispute that revolves around this. It's uh, the Rambam Sefer Mada, Hilchos Tshuva, Perakim HaChazayim. Many of you probably don't know what uh, you're looking at here. Uh, what, what, it, what translation is this? Uh, we have the translation by Chabad of the Rambam. Um, there's the Yale University, but this is the Yale University translation only has the uh, the English. Uh, the, um, the Chabad edition has Hebrew and English with a commentary. But this has not just the Hebrew in English, it has the Rivad's criticisms, uh, also in English. This is a, a rare book, not very well known. I got it uh, used books years ago. It's a translation by a rabbi, Simon Glazer. And he only did volume one of um, of uh, their Mishnah Torah. He wanted to complete to whom? Who's Simon Glazer? Well, here's a picture of Simon Glazer. He, as it says in Wikipedia, an Orthodox rabbi who flourished at the turn of the 20th century from Kovno. He was rabbi in Montreal in New York City. I was thinking about him today because one of the places he was rabbi in was, uh, well, he was in Toledo, Ohio, uh, but he also was rabbi in Kansas City, and I'm going to Kansas City for this Shabbos. So um, uh, I was thinking about him uh, today. He was rabbi in Basement of Chagado in Harlem, also uh, Bethel in Brooklyn. That's uh, Bethel uh, in Borough Park. And uh, you can read all about him. He wrote a number of books, as uh, you can see, including a book on the Jews of Iowa. Um, and he um, he was rabbi... Um, ah, okay, in Montreal. He was known as... Um, chief rabbi of what they called the United Orthodox Congregations, or chief rabbi of Montreal, and he did a lot. But this created a huge machokas between him and another rabbi. You can read all about it in Ira Robinson's book, Rabbis in Their Community, Studies in East European Orthodox Rabbi in Montreal. Great dispute between a Rabbi Hirsch Cohen and um, a Rabbi Simon Glazer about uh, Hashkacha, you know, his big business. In fact, the Rabbi Glazer, Robinson discussed it, was attacked by some ruffians once uh, uh, because of uh, had to do with the Hashkacha business. Uh, in addition to his uh, peripatetic existence as a rabbi, and uh, many of these rabbis were like it, incidentally, at the introduction to this in Hebrew, in the introduction to the translation of the Mishnah, he has a Hebrew. Uh, 
autobiography, which uh, I, I always love these autobiographies. Many rabbis uh, would write, used to write these autobiographies, and they, they all say the same thing, or many of them do, that when I was young, I was an Eloy, and there was no one who could teach me, so I had to go to this rabbi, that rabbi. Uh, it's interesting. Okay, so why am I... Uh, what am I uh, interested in Rabbi Glazer's uh, translation? It's this halacha. So before we see how this is used by uh, Bomberger, let's see what the Ramam says. Halacha Zion. It's a famous halacha. Chamisha hein hanikrai minim. There are five who are called minim. Uh, Glazer translates this as atheists. That's not what a min is. Uh, doesn't mean atheist. It could mean an atheist, but it doesn't mean atheist. It means a heretic. Uh, when we have in Shmona Esrei, Birkas Aminim, it doesn't mean uh, um, blessing against uh, the atheists. Um, yeah, so, uh, I, I mean, that's just a mistake. But the rest of the translation is okay. Ha'omer she'en sham en lola. Ve'en lola manhig ve'omer. So the first one is, who says there is no God and the world has no um, ruler. Uh, by the way, this is the most mistranslated word in Hebrew. Aleph, Lav, Vam, and I'm convinced of this. Um, and you can hear all the people mistranslate it because we say it in Halal. You say it in Yom Yom but Halal, you say it out loud often. In um, whether you sing it uh, in Malacha um, Hayam or whether they just recite it. You have people often say, Eloha, you know, there's a dagesh in the hay, so they like to stress it, but it's, it's the first of all, the accent is on the ramen, not on the hay, it's a, and it's Eloha. So the, the master reads give two ways of pronouncing it. It's either Eloha or Eloha with a W. This is what's called a patach genuva. Patach is not the feminine, but it's tenuat, patach genuva. It's called a furtive patach. It's no different than what we have, noach. We've spoken about this in the past. You don't say nocha, noah. It's uh, noah, uh, noach. That is, the, the syllable goes before the last letter. Okay, that's the first heretics. Understand. What's the second heretic? Um, you say that there is um, a ruler. This word sham here doesn't mean place. It's just an Arabic type of, uh, it's a trans... It's bringing over to Hebrew um, the Arabic word. It doesn't really have a translation. It just, it's like is. Uh, if you look at Ibn Tibon's um, introduction to his translation or yeah, his, his, to the Mor Nevuchim, he explains that word sham. Uh, it's amazing how many people give, uh, try to explain what that word sham is. Um, there is a a, a, an omnipotent force, a ruler, whatever. But there's more than one God. That's so those are the first two heresies. The third heresy is the one we're interested in. You acknowledge that there's one God. But you say that he has a physical form. You're a heretic. And for the Rambam, uh, this is obvious. Uh, by definition, a, um, a being that has physicality is subject to corruption. It, by definition, cannot be perfect because if you have a body, you're in this place, you're not in that place. Uh, you can't be omnipotent because you're limited by your physicality. As I said, there's decay. So the, the Rambam, by definition, philosophically, uh, God cannot have a physical form. Um, so what does the Rivet say on this? And if you're interested in more details about this, you can open up uh, my book, Limits of Orthodox Theology, Chapter 3, because this is also the Rambam's third principle of the Mishnah Torah, uh, of the 13 principles. So what does the Rivet say? If you say that their God is uh, one, but uh, he's physical form, Amar Avraham, the Ravad's name is Avraham, Abraham. The Lama Karal is a min. Why does the Rambam call such a person a min? The Chama Gedolim Vitovi Mimenu Hachu Bazo Machshava. There are people greater than the Rambam who followed this uh, belief, namely that God had a physical form. Why they think this? Lafimasha Rauba Mikros, based on what they saw in the scriptures. 
the because after all, it says in Tanakh that uh, God walks through the garden. God has an outstretched arm. And more based on what they saw in the Agadah, which uh, confused people. Uh, God puts on tefillin, things like that. Now, the Raiva doesn't think this is correct. God does not have a physical form. But he says there are people who think that, great people. He knew that the Rambam was great. He's saying even people greater than the Rambam. Again, I'm not going to get into this now. Take a look at Limits of Orthodox Theology to see who he was speaking about and where these people would get these ideas. But what the Raivat says that's important for us is that these people are not heretics. Why are they not heretics? Because the, uh, it was an honest error. They weren't rebelling against Judaism. They read the Torah and Navi, and they read Gemara, and they mistakenly assumed that these things should be taken literally when they're not. And therefore, how can you call them heretics? They don't know any better. Now, it's it's not clear whether the Ravad thought this was a heresy um, to believe God is a physical form. It could be he didn't. Uh, but later figures did agree with the Ramam that this is heresy, and they accept the Ravad's position that someone who doesn't know any better is not to be regarded as a heretic. And this then creates a great dispute that lasts from the Rambam's day to the present. The Sugi, you can call it Kafira Bashogi. What about an unwitting heretic? A heretic, someone who believes in a heresy but doesn't know any better. So the Rambam, and this ties into his naturalistic uh, understanding of what the world to come is, there, there's no such thing as a an an unwitting heretic does not exempt you. Reb Chaim Soloveitchik famously formulated it as, Reb Chaim Brisker I'm talking about, is a nebuch apikaris is oich If you're a nebuch apikaris, if you don't know any better, you're still a heretic. But the Ravad, and well, again, assuming the Ravad sees it as heresy, Rav Yosef Albo quotes the Ravad, adopts this position, he sees it as heresy. And you can go from Rav Yosef Albo to the Radbaz down to the present day, um, uh, Rav, uh, Rav Cook, Rav Arnsel, I think Rav Arnsel, actually, I don't know about Rav Arnsel nature. Rav Cook definitely says it. Uh, uh, Rav Moshe Sternbach, many, many others. Namely, someone who someone who is uh, believes heresy, but believes it because they don't know any better. They were raised this way, or it's an honest mistake. They are not to be regarded as heretics. So a kofar b'shogeg, one who's an unwitting heretic, is not to be regarded as a heretic. That is, the belief is heretical, but he is not a heretic. Now, um, this opens up all sorts of options, which we'll see presently, because um, what about the Reformed Jew? Are all Reformed Jews to be regarded as uh, heretics and uh, rejectors? Uh, maybe they don't know any better. And this is why this passage is important for us, because the Rabbi Bomberger picks up on this. In the collected writings on uh, page 236, he, um, he first quotes um, Hirsch. Hirsch, in issuing his psaq, that it was forbidden to remain in a community that uh, the leadership of this community were reformers. What does uh, Hirsch say? As a matter of principle, you, 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 here says, how can anyone remain in such a community that, quote, as a matter of principle has stricken from its prayer book every reference to the person of Mashiach, to the kibbutz galiot, to the, you know, re, re, the bringing together of the exiles, to the restoration of the base of Migdash, to the Seder of Voda, past and future, that has eliminated Eretz Ubris and Malchus Beis David from Birkas Amazon. What name do you give to such a system whose pulpit and school preach that the mitzvot are outdated? Well, so uh, what does Hirsch say? I would saw he agrees. He says, I would call such a community the most blatant minus and apicarsis. And he says a community that professes such a belief system in its liturgy um, is in the category of minos and apikorsos, and every Jew must regard such a system as totally incompatible with traditional Judaism. Uh, but he says, but Bamberger goes further and says, however, this system does not reach the true culmination of its contrast to Torah if it springs from ignorance, 
were from a faulty and erroneous interpretation of Torah, in which case it can't be considered fear. So Bomberger says that when dealing with the non-Orthodox, with the reformers, we have to ask, are they reformers because they are lahachis? They are no, they are knowledgeable. They're people like Geiger, let's say, who know what the Torah says and they're choosing to reject it. Or are we dealing with people who don't know any better? And therefore, yes, their belief system, their ideology is minus, he says, apikorsos. But the people themselves will not have that status. And therefore, we are not going to be forbidden from joining together with them in the name of the greater good. He goes further, and he says that this distinction, Bomberger says, between um, unwitting heretics, let's say, and um, not knowing heretics, he says this is fully confirmed. Um, all you have to do is look in the Rambam. And yes, the Rambam says his position, but the Raivat, he says, most categorically opposes the use of this epithet, namely a heretic, for such an individual, the individual who doesn't know any better. He says the Raivat declares that if this error has arisen from a misinterpretation, then he can't be labeled as min. And he says, from this it's clear that if someone commits a transgression against an indisputable principle of the Torah, but does so not because he denies the binding authority of that principle, but because he doesn't understand it, you can't describe him as a heretic. Well, and we're going to see. So then well, why would this apply to the Jews of Frankfurt? We're going to see why Bomberger will apply it to them in a second. Um. He says, where the cause is not lack of understanding, but want and denial, lahachis. then we're dealing with, he says, a mesi sumediach, someone who is a chote omachti atarabi, one who knowingly is rejecting the proper ideas and uh, bringing other people into their net. But is that what we're uh, focused on here? So Bomberger says no. He says, how do you know, he says, quote, whether a reformed community and its trustees belong to the first category, namely that of um, uh, complete heretics, like her said, or the second category that uh, they're, um, they don't know any better. And what's the answer? He says, it's obvious. That's what he says. He says, it's very clear. Listen to this. If a community would be in a position, financially and otherwise, to provide for the needs of its Orthodox members and to establish and maintain the institutions indispensable to any pious Jew, but it fails to do so, then he says that um, such a reformed community shows that they are not established on any proper foundation. They don't just uh, uh, accept a, a position that deviates from orthodoxy, but they are denying the foundations of the Torah. Because if this were not true, he says they would at least have a sense of fairness. And maybe they're not following uh, traditional understandings of Torah and mitzvahs, but they'll at least allow the orthodox to do that and fund it. Therefore, when you have such a community, such a community would be regarded, that you have to classify them as al-hachis and as mesis and However, um, is that the case in Frankfurt? And he says, um, well, he, actually, before he goes into that, he says, I, and I agree with you, Hirsch, on all this. In fact, he cites a letter he, he wrote in which he sent uh, to individuals in Frankfurt. And he said that um, it's categorically forbidden for Torah Jews to participate in any matter manner in the operation and maintenance of a hospital run by a reformed community, even if one member of the um, Orthodox community was elected to the board of the reformed community. So uh, Bomberger goes so far as to say that if the community we're speaking about in Frankfurt is a real reformist community, okay, and there's a hospital in the community, an Orthodox Jew would not even be permitted to be on the board um, of the reform community in connection with that institution. That is, you couldn't even be on the board of the hospital as long as the hospital is under the control of the uh, reformers. He says that even the addition of a member of the religion's Gesellschaft to the board of the hospital cannot change anything. Um, 
The, he says the board, furthermore, he says you cannot have a board member at all on anything dealing with uh, uh, religious issues that is no that is out of a lower standard than the rabbis. In other words, in a community, you cannot have the board member of a shul who's not a Shomer Shabbos. He says the board members of the community must meet the same standards of religious conduct as the members of a rabbinical council. And that's something that, uh, look at your typical Orthodox shul outside the New York area. They all have board members who are... Um, uh, Shabbos. I should say many of them do. Uh, look at schools. I can tell you, Adrian Namano, that major schools, Jewish high schools and elementary schools have members who are not Shomri Shabbos, but they give a lot of money and they want to support the institution. I've never heard anyone say that they can't, in our communities, modern Orthodox, that they can't be members of the board. It was well known that in uh, separatist communities, for example, in Hungary, uh, Hershey community also, if you're not a Shomer Shabbos, you couldn't be on the board. But uh, that's not the way we do things in America. I don't know who was on the board of Maimonides, but I'm assuming when the Rev was alive, there were plenty of people who were not Shomer Shabbos on the board. Uh, they didn't make decisions. They were just there to raise money. And if they want to contribute, it's, but so we see that Bomberger is a, is a Kanai, you could say. He's an extremist on these matters, more extreme than other people were. Absolutely. Um. So that if you have what he regards as a reform community, it cannot be recognized by Orthodox Jews at all. Um, however, let's now uh, look what he says, though, about um, on page 240. Um, no, not 240. He says, um, um, at page 241 and 242, he says as follows. Um if you're looking at the Frankfurt community, the Frankfurt general community, which is go, which has agreed. Now, why they decided to agree to that, or Hirsch would say maybe that's relevant, but Bamberger is not concerned. The fact is they did agree. Uh, I mean, you could say the only reason they agreed is because they didn't want to lose the tax money, but the fact is they agreed. What did they agree to? To build an Orthodox synagogue. That's the synagogue that if you go to Frankfurt today, right next to the museum and right next to the, um, it was called the Bornplatz. Shul, right next to where the cemetery is, where all the Gedolias are buried. If you go there on the ground, you could see they have a uh, like a, a, a drawing of where it was. You see how, but because uh, it was destroyed in Kristallnacht, uh, uh, they not only build a shul, hire a rabbi, a real rabbi, a Talmud Chacham. They would hire a Mordechai Harvitz, Marcus Harvitz. We'll speak more about him later. A uh, recognized great Talmudic scholar, Talmud Muvak of Israel Hildesheimer. He's known as the Mate Levi. They offered to build the mikvah. They offered to have, they because remember, they closed the mikvah and they put it out in one of the, they, the Jews would have to go to the suburbs. They offered that they would allow the Orthodox to have complete autonomy. That is, the uh, the board members of the general community would have no influence whatsoever, not in choosing the rabbi, not in how the show is run, not in how the school, anything, any Orthodox institution would be completely run by the Orthodox community. The only connection would be that the tax money would go to the community and then it would go back, of course, to the Orthodox community and would be used to support institutions that they all use, such as the hospital, the old age home, and the hospital and old age home would be under Orthodox control in terms of religious issues like uh, like um, Kashras. There also would be a based in that would be um, of the general community. Um, I'll talk more about uh, who was on that based in, uh, in later uh, classes, uh, important people. Uh, uh, under these circumstances, Bomberger says that since we see the leadership of the community willing to give the Orthodox everything they want, we cannot regard them as out of the fold. We have to regard them as sinners, as people who are misguided, but not heretics of the sort that we can't have anything to do with. He says, the board of the community is now prepared to provide for the needs of the non-seceding Orthodox members by setting up for them with communal funds the religious institutions they require. At the same time, said members will not have to make any financial contributions towards facilities for reform, worship, and education. See, the reform are the majority. So it's not a problem. The Orthodox, all their taxes are going back to their institutions. It would have been a problem 
if let's say 70% of the community is Orthodox and 30% is reformed, then the Orthodox are giving money that's going to the reform. But that wasn't the situation. He says, we see from this that the board recognizes the legitimacy of the religious requirements of the Orthodox and is ready to implement them. In other words, the board has no wish to deny vis-a-vis -vis the Orthodox the strict and sacred binding authority of the Torah. He goes on to say, not only does it not seek to impede their observance of Torah, of Torah, on the contrary, uh, although they profess reform, and that's a, a terrible thing, uh, nevertheless, when it comes to the Orthodox, they, are, they wish to trust the safeguarding and protection of these religious concerns entirely to the Orthodox. Now, if I'm Hirsch here, I'm sitting here rolling my eyes because this is the same community that uh, five years before was doing everything in its power to, uh, you know, to prevent the Orthodox from having a, a an Orthodox lifestyle. They were uh, oppressing them. I, I use the word oppressing. I guess they were oppressing them. They weren't giving them what they want. That's what the word uh, oppressing means. Uh, not the, the woke uh, oppression that you hear about all the time. Everything's a oppre different oppression. But uh, they were uh, they were not treating the Orthodox fairly. They were prejudiced against them. So all of a sudden now, when the Orthodox are going to succeed because the law was passed, um, now the reform are willing to give them everything they want. You're gonna, how does that change who they are? They're the same people. They're just making a different decision on the basis of uh, financial considerations. Uh, if I'm here, I'm sitting there thinking uh, they're the same apikorsim, and that's the same kafira, and it's it's not that out of the goodness of their heart. They're giving us the Orthodox everything they want. Nevertheless, Bomberger he writes, I, you know, at the end of the day, you have to look at their actions. Whether Bomberger thought that they were Jose Bachuva due to the financial pressures, or whether, for, as far as he's concerned, it doesn't matter. Dvarim Shabalei and Dvarim, we say. What you think in your heart doesn't matter. The fact is, they're giving the Orthodox everything the Orthodox want, and therefore we cannot regard them anymore as people interested in uprooting Torah Judaism. They do not practice Torah Judaism. In their own communities, they have uprooted it. But being that they're willing, not just willing, but going to the effort to give the Orthodox everything they want so that they can have uh, Torah Judaism. We cannot regard them anymore as um, as out of the fold. We, can regard, when I, we can't regard them as heretics. Yes, they believe heresy, obviously, but they can't be regarded as heretics. Of course, we would call them heretics. That's what a heretic is, when it believes heresy. But from the standpoint of the way the Rambam regards it, uh, a heretic is one who you can have nothing to do with. You have to, uh, you could push him in a pit if you, in the olden days. I mean, all that, he's no longer in the community. Completely, we have no connection to them whatsoever. And Bomberger says, since they're willing to do all this for the Orthodox, we cannot treat them this way. And, um, uh, okay. And uh, that that that's an amazing thing. So, uh, I, and and the final thing he says is the this community, the general community, has agreed to hire a Moritz Sedek, a Moritz Sedek, a rabbi, and this will be Bomberger says one who will be able of issue able to issue directives for all religious matters, um, and there will be a board of trustees that is completely religious. And if you don't get if this you don't have guarantees for this, then my ruling doesn't stand. So uh, that's his position. Um, it's uh, it's something we can appreciate. I think it's something we can understand. Most of our communities function this way. If you're in the modern Orthodox world, that is, uh, the rabbis are involved in federations and have various uh, connections to the non-Orthodox. And uh, um, Bomberger says uh, that as long as they're not actively trying to undermine Torah Judaism, and all the more so, they're even helping Torah Judaism. Uh, then uh, we we don't we don't need to separate from them. There's other things he says that are relevant. So, for example, on page two forty eight, he says that when you're dealing with such a situation, when the non Orthodox are not interested in uprooting Torah Judaism by us being connected to them, there's advantages. Why? He says, although we reject and detest the belief system of reform, this should not break the ties of personal friendship that bind us. We cherish the hope that sooner or later that the non-Orthodox will come to realize the truth, as uh, we do. Um, so if the reformers were actively trying to uproot Torah Judaism, we couldn't have anything to do with them. No chance for Kirov. 
However, as long as they're not actively doing that, we can remain in the same community and we can have a good influence on them. Um, let me point out some other things that uh, Bomberger says because he responds uh, to Hirsch. On page uh, 245, he, uh, uh, he responds to Hirsch saying as follows. He said, here says that according to Halakha, we must keep a, a, a greater distance from Minus and Apikorsos than even from Avodazara. That is from heresy, than from we have to keep further from um, than from uh, idolatry. Do you know that in Hirsch's school in Frankfurt, they would never hire non-Orthodox Jews to teach? They would hire religious Jews and Christians. Hirsch said that if you hire a non-religious Jew to teach a class, the children, of course, it's not, not like today in America where they uh, they demean teachers. In those days, the teacher you gave kavod to, uh, you looked up to. If you have a non-Orthodox teacher, the students are going to look to this teacher, and he'll be a, they'll be a, they'll, he'll be a, a, an element of admiration. You admire the teacher, a role model. Here said you cannot have a non-Orthodox Jew teaching in a school because the teacher will be a role model. And what's the role model? That uh, you could be a, a dignified person, a good person, and not be a Shomer Shabbos, not eat kosher. So you can't have that. In America, of course, well, I shouldn't say that. These are private schools. You can do what you want. But never, it's unimaginable that our high schools, our day schools, would uh, ever say that we're not going to hire uh, non-religious Jews. We have the rights. We're private schools. We could do that. Um, years ago, I bet they wouldn't hire uh, people who intermarried. Because that would have been out of the fault. Today, uh, we're not concerned with that. We don't look who's intermarried, who's not. It's not a concern of ours. Uh, but Hirsch wouldn't. So Hirsch would hire Christians to teach. Because, uh, like we just said, Minos and Apicorsus, we have to keep further from it than Avoda Zara. He says, we have to keep further away from contact with Jewish elements that oppose Jewish law than we do from paganism. And he brings proof. What's the proof? The Gemara says that um, in order to save your life, you're allowed to go into a, um, take shelter in a house of Odazara, but not in a house of Minim. And uh, he quotes another Gemara, and Avodazara, Rabbi Shmuel says that someone should die rather than be treated by a Min. But not a problem if uh, a worshiper, a pagan is going to treat you, not a problem. And he, Hirsch goes on and explains that Minos is different because it'll bring you towards it. It can, um, it's enticing for you. And it's um, it's more likely to lead a Jew astray than outright idolatry. Consequently, it's clear beyond question that anything forbidden to us with regard to Avodah Zara is even more emphatically forbidden when it comes to Minos. Okay, so what is, so here he's saying that, um, Obviously, we can't be together with the Christians uh, in, in one community. So certainly we can't be together with the uh, the non-Orthodox, the heretics, and even more so, even if you tell me that maybe in certain things you could be with the Christians, it's easier to be with the Christians than it is with the uh, heretics, because by being with them, by sitting with them, by being involved with them, we can be negatively influenced to um, be led in the direction of reform. So what does Bomberger say to this? It appears to be good uh, sources. He says... I'm only going to tell you what Bomberger says. Then Hirsch replies to him. Uh, Bomberger says to him, when you said this, Rabbi Hirsch, uh, you must have followed your memory. You didn't look up the sources, because had you looked up the sources, you never could have said this. And he and he cites, well, why does he say that? Because um, he Bom Bomberger says to him, the Gemara is speaking about Minim. Who are Minim? Minim are Jews who became pagans. Jews who completely... Uh, rejected the Judaism for idolatry. He says, that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about Jews who have been raised, he says, um, and educated by his parents in his erroneous beliefs. Um, he says, how can you compare the Reformed Jews that were with in Frankfurt who don't know any better and uh, with uh, people who are actually pagans, people who, had, who knew the true faith but I denied and abandoned it. Uh, so um, you have to distinguish between the two. And he says also Rabbi Shmuel, the same case with Rabbi Shmuel. He says, you need to distinguish between pagans, people opposed in principle to Jewish law, 
as opposed to people who just don't follow the Jewish law. But their attitude is, if we don't follow it, it's not good for me. If you want to follow it, you can follow it. Minim and Apikarsim want to spread their heresy. That's not the case with the people we're dealing with in Frankfurt. Uh, whether that's the Mitzios, as we say or not, I, I, I think very much that Hirsch would disagree with him. In fact, later in Hirsch's response, he says, Bomberger, you come to town. How can you, you make decisions based upon speaking to someone? If you're not in the city, you don't see what's really going on here. And I mean, that's uh, something he could say about this as well. Uh, he goes on to say, Okay, so he continues saying the, the uh, uh, same thing. And then finally, towards the end, he says, uh, Bomberger says there's three types of Jews in Frankfurt. There's the strictly Orthodox, who are a member of Hirsch's community. Then there are the Reformers. And then there are those who have not joined Hirsch's community, uh, nor the Reform. These are just people who... Uh, continue going to the Orthodox synagogue that exists in Frankfurt and uh, are sort of on the fence because many of, remember, the real Orthodox in Frankfurt joined Hirsch's community. The problem was for Hirsch is that when they were given the opportunity to withdraw from the general community, they refused to because they felt ties of colleagues for all, all sorts of reasons. Bomberger says, Hirsch, you're forgetting about this middle group namely the group of basically Torah-observant Jews who are not so mock-paid, who haven't joined your community, but they want religious um, life. They want a Torah life, but they're not uh, the most strict. He says, but the, are we supposed to abandon these people? Are we not supposed to give them institutions? They're not joining your community here. Don't they need a mikvah? I don't understand. I mean, they don't want, they're not a member of your community. For whatever reason, they don't want to go to your community. Maybe they feel they have to join it, they can't afford it, they don't want it, whatever it is. Uh, they don't want to go to your shul. Shouldn't they have the right to have a shul? If we don't give them a shul, maybe they'll start attending uh, the Reform Synagogue. Remember, Reform Synagogues, they have an organ, but they didn't have mixed seating. Uh, you know, you can see how people in the middle could be led astray. He says that we have a responsibility for these people as well. Uh religious law does not forbid us to use our financial means to help establish institutions also for these people. Um, he says that we're not obligated to. He says there's no obligation to open up another shul or another mikvah for these people because your community here has it. So technically we're not obligated to, but there's no prohibition. And if we have the money, why not do it? Um, and he concludes by saying um, that uh, what we've seen already, that the, sep the session law is a great blessing for Orthodox Jews. It allows Jews the opportunity to secede when necessary. It also, as we know, forces the general community to give um, um, compromises. Um, he says that I do not doubt for a minute that your community will continue to exist and carry on. And uh, I do not believe that, that people who refuse to secede will negatively affect uh, your community. And then he says something uh, Hirsch has attacked him. We're going to see next class uh, why Hirsch attacked him. Yaakov Katz has an interesting approach to this. But uh, uh, Hirsch, in his response, his initial response to Bomberg, his first letter, says that, well, this is not surprising because we know that you, Rabbi Bomberger, don't accept Tarim Derech Heretz. You don't agree with our philosophy. So, of course, you're going to come out against us. Um. What does Bomberger say to this? He says, um, it is true. He says that I am not in, well, let me, actually, let me read the words. He, he says, you are mistaken when you say that I am not. I do not support Torim Derech Eretz. He says, I'm in favor of Torim Derech Eretz, but I don't want it to be misinterpreted. Is I, What he's saying is that you, Rabbi Hirsch, have misinterpreted it to your extreme infatuation, I guess he would say, with Western civilization, Derek Heretz. What Bomberger says, he says, I want rabbis to acquire a scientific secular education. Absolutely. We know that Bomberger himself acquired a secular education. We're not dealing with some Polish uh, Hasidic rabbi or some rabbi in Hungary who put a ban on secular education. No, yes, I believe in secular education, he says. However, 
This cannot happen at the expense of Torah study. That's a dig, of course, as to uh, what's going on in Frankfurt. He says, the ladder must be safeguarded in its full vigor against any abridgment or de detraction. But he says, yes, I want teachers of religion to know about secular studies. And that it, this all has to be taught. He says that uh, he, he then cites um, a passage from the recent report of his teacher seminary, where he says that um, by studying general sciences, this doesn't interfere with any Torah matters. On the contrary, if properly understood, it's in beautiful harmony with the latter. That is, Torah and secular and science, they, they, they go together. So it's a difference in degree, perhaps, uh, that Hirsch is, and I, I don't know if uh, Bomberger was into the humanities. You know, it could be that he's more interested in, in science. I, I, I've never seen any um, place where uh, that would imply that Bomberger thinks that, you know, studying Schiller or Goethe, that that, you know, helps form the religious personality. So this is the response of Bomberger, a strong defense of his position, a novel view that the reform that we are dealing with here, they themselves, although they are uh, misguided and uh, preaching heresy, they themselves are not in the category of heresy uh, of the sort that we need to, of heretics that we need to separate ourselves totally from. And as long as they give the Orthodox community everything the Orthodox community wants, then uh, we, could, uh, we could, we could get along with them and we could do things uh, that benefit uh, all of us. Uh, now, Rav Bomberger's son, Rav Simcha Bomberger, has a, a volume of Chuvos, um, Zecher Simcha. And in number 230, he continues with this and defends his father's position and goes into detail. And he says right at the beginning of it, uh, he says, uh, he, he gives, he stresses this point, uh, um, that if we're members of the community, uh, that Ulai al Kane. Tigbor Yad that maybe the Orthodox will become stronger. The Tikbatel, the Tikbatel Ha Reform, the Chola. The God of Koach Hashalom, Ofen Azer, Yotem Lidhot Beshtei Adayim Lachadoma. He says that if we belong to the general community, then maybe we're going to have an influence and maybe we can uh, triumph over reform. And uh, peace in such matters is always very important, and it's better to have peace than to push them away. Beshtei Adayim. That's he's alluding to the story with Jesus, where the problem was the rabbi say the problem was that Jesus they didn't just push him away with one hand, they pushed him away with both hands. When you're dealing with people who have uh, incorrect beliefs, you're not supposed to push them away with both hands. Yes, you can push them away with one hand meaning talk about how the belief is incorrect, but don't push them away with two hands because then you're just losing them forever. So Rav Ze the Zecher Simcha says, by being part of the community and by not pushing them away, by being together with them in one community and show them, we still have the one hand that we can bring them close and we can uh, be makari of them. We, uh, we, the, the, we can accept their children into our schools. We can uh, try to make sure that all joint events are done with a, a Torah flavor to them to slowly to try to bring uh, Yiddishkeit to them. And uh, and that, that's a position, again, and I think uh, many of us are uh, are well aware of because uh, the communities we're in adopt that position uh, as well. Uh, much to Hirsch's great disappointment, you know, despite the fact that, as I said, I think if you read Hirsch's response to Bamberger, it really, uh, it, he makes very good points, but... Well, at the end of the day, though, um, it's really not important from the standpoint of the Balabat team who has the better argument uh, or if an argument is strong or weak. When a great Torah sage like Rabbi Bamberger says that you don't need to separate, that's the halacha for most people. It's like us. If if Ramosha Feinstein or Vavad Yosef would come out with a psaq, maybe we'd read the psaq and we'd say it's not so convincing in certain areas. But that doesn't take away from the fact that we can rely on it because uh, these are the Gatoli Yisrael. And who are we? Uh, uh, I mean, we're, we're not in their league. So, uh, yes, we can look at it and maybe say not everything's so convincing. But by virtue of their office, as it were, uh, they have the authority. So the fact that the Godo Hador in Germany, Roy Bomberger, said that you don't need to separate in, under these conditions uh, 
most people are not going to be reading the back and forth between Hirsch and Bamberger. Her, the Hirschians continue to say, read the writing, read the arguments back and forth, and tell me if you think that uh, Rob Bamberger's position uh, gets, is the better one, is the more correct one. But that's not what people are going to do. And they don't have to do that. A regular ball bus doesn't need to evaluate these arguments. He can look at the fact that Rabbi Bumberger held his position. And uh, and that's why Hirschian, although Torim der Heretz became uh, widely adopted throughout Germany, the Austrit philosophy uh, was never more than... Um, you know, uh, in small in small segments of the population, it became accepted in most places, including in places like Frankfurt and Berlin, where you had a separatist community. Uh, most Orthodox Jews um, were not members of it, and even the more and if they were members, they didn't. I should say most Orthodox Jews were members of the larger community. This includes even most Orthodox Jews who are a member of Hirsch's own community, um, including the Rothschild family, the big backers of it. Um, now, one of the reasons for this um, is that people did not, people had a connection, first of all, to the community, the larger community. They felt a sense of responsibility. Maybe we don't have that today because we're um, in America, we don't have Kehilos. But if you've been living in Frankfurt, your family's been living there for hundreds of years, the idea that you're going to leave the community, they had a great sense of connection, responsibility, Kehilo Kadosha. Here said, no, we are the Kehilo Kadosha. That's not the Kehilo Kadosha. Once the reform took over, it's no longer the Kiel Kadosha, the community. We're the Kiel Kadosha. But that's not how the people saw it, because it's that that is the community. That is the historic community, even though it was taken over by the reform. But now it's not run by the reform. Now, or now it's only run by partly run by the reform, because we have our own Orthodox community uh in the in the original community. And uh, the cemetery. I, I don't know why people were so attached to the cemetery. It's not the classic cemetery. They had built a new cemetery like a generation before that. So it's not like my Zadie, my Alta Zadie, and they're all buried in this cemetery. And I want to be buried there. The the new Frankfurt Cemetery, uh, uh, you, maybe your parents were there, but it, it doesn't go back many generations. That's the original cemetery where the Godoy, so the Pene Yeshua, the Maral Schiff are buried. That's the cemetery. And the Hassan Sofer's mother is there. You can go visit that. It's a big tourist uh, attraction uh, when you go to Frankfurt. But uh um, so, but what I all I can say is they were uh, they were connected to the cemetery. If you go to the cemetery today, you see during World War II a bomb fell on it, and uh, it uh, broke the wall because the the Hershians had to open up their own cemetery. So you had two cemeteries right next to each other so, with a wall in the middle. Now the wall, the, 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 I, I can't say that's what I was told when I was there that a bomb landed on it. Uh, I don't know if the bomb broke the whole thing down so it opened up whatever they uh maybe it's a good story if it did but uh if you go there today you see that they op they opened it up and you can walk from one to the other as it should be and i was told that a bomb landed on, i guess it's symbolic that the bomb landed on the wall even if it didn't break it open completely it showed that maybe in today's day and age we shouldn't have these uh separate that at least in death we should all be together and by the way hirsch did not oppose this Hirsch never said, came out with a prohibition of being buried in the regular cemetery. You know, the Orthodox and have a separate, I mean, I could see why he should have said this, but as far as I know, he never said that, in fact, he never said that the Orthodox in the communal cemetery, that it's a prohibition for them to be buried there. If they have their own section of the cemetery. He said it's not a problem. He said that the reason we're not being buried there is because the the community won't allow us to be buried there because we don't pay taxes. Now that I think of it, though, I don't know why Hirsch didn't think it was a problem. Why? I mean, he, um, it, it's a it's a cemetery that belongs to the community. The community has reformers in it, so why should we be buried in such a cemetery? Um, he obviously made a distinction between living with these people and being part of uh, institutions that they have a say in and being buried there. Um, it would seem to me that he, that he should have said, let's have our own cemetery, but he didn't. And as for the people who said, he, in other words, he only built the cemetery when he had to. And as for the people who said, we want to be buried in this cemetery, and therefore we can't leave the, the Gemeinde, the uh, general community, Hirsch could not understand this at all. He said, you're worried about where you're going to be buried? And you're sinning by being in this community. Every day you're sinning, and uh, we'll make our own cemetery. Uh, uh, I'll give you next class. I see it's already time. I will give you the actual numbers 
of who remained in, in, in Hirsch's community, sorry, and who remained in the general community and who seceded and was only a member of Hirsch's community. And you'll see what I mean when I say he was a great failure for Hirsch, a failure that Hirsch realized. And this failure continued uh, uh, until the end of um, the Frankfurt community. Um, and um, well, this had all sorts of implications because if you know the history of it, we'll talk more about it maybe. Uh, it created a huge machokis in the Frankfurt community itself over who would succeed, uh, not Hirsch, but Hirsch's son-in-law, who would be the successor to them, because many of the people thought that the Hirschian family had become, even though Hirsch is the, the great rabbi of this community, he had become, the family had become too extreme on this matter, and uh, we'll talk more about that, we'll deal with uh, I think you're probably interested, so I'll, I'll talk more about what happens in the two Frankfurt communities, uh, um, the extremism. Do you know that the Hirschians put a cherem on the Bornplatz synagogue? You could not enter it, but very few people followed it, but that was the official position. Hirsch refused to greet Rabbi Marcus Mordechai Harvitz when he was appointed the rabbi there, and he and his son-in-law refused to be in the same room if they could help it with Rabbi Mordechai Marcus Halevi Horowitz. So uh, it was very, very bitter. So, uh, oh, and I will tell you next class as well that uh, for the irony here is because for all the extremism of Hirsch in Frankfurt, when it came to Hungary, Hirsch refused to go along with the separatism in Hungary. And I'll explain that. Uh, let me make a note of that to tell you next class. Uh, um We'll have to talk about Hungary, too, because uh, after we finish with this, we got to go with Hungary, because the Maram Shik has a tshuva opposing Bamberger. So we need to understand what was going on in Hungary. And then, of course, we'll take it to America as well. Um, uh, thank you, Morty, for saying that Rabbi Murray Slam's book says not to, the, the you're saying he says, I have the book upstairs. I didn't look at it, actually, that the... Uh, the, the woman does not make a bracha when she's an Onin. Okay, I have to check that out. I did not know. I should have checked. I looked in other books. I didn't look in that. Uh, Paul says that the Abramsky anecdote is in Bernard Homa's A Fortress in Anglo Jewry, History of the Machsiki Adas, uh, um, uh, the East End Synagogue. Yes, thank you very much. Um, I was thinking about that book today because I'm, I'm always ahead of where we're going to be. So after we finish the Bumberger, need probably four more classes with him, I would think. Then I'm going to do the Musser dispute. And then I'm going to do Rabbi Moliver, founder of religious Zionism, or one of the founders of religious Zionism. And he was involved in the great um, dispute over um, between the Machziki Adas and the, the chief rabbinate. So uh, I was uh, thinking about that book today. Um, um Someone texts me uh, regarding Minos Napikarsis. I don't know what the relevance is that uh, when the famous story, which Rodai Hoffman mentions in his Chuvos, I discussed it in Changing the Immutable, when he came to visit uh, Hirsch, that he told him that um, not to leave his hat on because the non Jews would see this, that is to be bareheaded, non Jews would see this. And see it as uh, something. Uh, it was. It was disrespect. Uh, um, now you say yamaka was fine. Uh, the implication of the tshuva is no yamaka. That's to go bareheaded when he went to see him. That's the whole tshuva. The tshuva is discussing about uh, how in the school, how in the Hershian school, they did not cover their heads at all for the secular subjects. So the tshuva there is about taking off your hat, any covering. Um, that that's just about that. Uh, Hirsch didn't want the um, the non-Jewish teachers to think that W. Hoffman was disrespecting him. Um, and then someone privately texts me. He says it's scary. Is that the the only the German Ashkenazic Jews are aware of and learn of Bamberger. Most of Shiva Bacharim have no idea of who he was and what he wrote. Um, well, it could be, I think, uh, you mentioned two books, Moral Shemaim and Moral Zvachim. It could be that uh, these are more practical halachic works. And yeshivas, they're not, yeshivas, they know who Rav Yaakov Etlinger was, who lives the same time as Bamberger, because he wrote Chidushim and Shas. And everyone learns the Arachaner, the Kuryakov. Uh, Rabbi Bamberger was focused on practical halacha rather than writing Chidushim and Shas. Uh, 
And that is probably the reason why they didn't know him. But, you know, you say it's uh, scary. They don't know him. The, the people in the yeshiva world don't know most of the Litvish Gadolim. They don't know most of the Polish Gadolim. They, the yeshiva world has a very small canon of what Sforim have made it in. And based on that, what Gadolim have made it in. Uh, yes, they know certain big figures from the 19th century, but uh, you can go down the list of all the of lots of Godolium that they don't know about them either. So that's not surprising. Uh, thank you, uh, Ricky. Um, David says that Shmir Shabbos Kochasa says that one lights Shabbos Yom Tov candles with a bracha, that is an onane lights it with the bracha. Okay, so we see uh, we have disputes here. Um M.J. Franco says, Semi Yafet, uh, I witnessed the whole thing, claimed in 1930 talk that the ones who did secede were all either independent on Rav Hirsch or on the uh, the IRG show in some way. Yes, uh, he wrote an article, um, Recollections. He was quoting from his, uh, actually, there's two articles. It's his article and Isaac Heinem. Isaac Heinemann wrote an article in which he recorded oral traditions from his father. Um Listen, there was uh, the, the dispute continued, and we're going to get to Rev, uh, Rev Chaim Ozer because then the dispute comes back in the early part of the 20th century. And the Hirschians tried to get Rev Chaim Ozer to, uh, uh, to come on their side. Well, I shouldn't say that. I, yeah, I know it's the Hirschians, as I recall. Um, there, there are great disputes in the uh, Hirschian community in Frankfurt itself. If we have time uh, at the end, I could speak about some of this. So you have people who know the history as well. But uh, the whole dispute over who would succeed, um, Rabbi Breuer, Rabbi Breuer, the son-in-law of Hirsch, when he passes away, the question is, who's going to succeed him? Uh, the family, the Hirschian family, wanted it to be uh, the son, Rafael Breuer, and keep it in the family. But the community did not want. And this led to bitter arguments and disputes in the community, a whole split in the community. You had a, one of the Dayanim came out with a public statement, but Jacob Rosenheim, Moreno Yaakov Rosenheim, led the forces in opposition to the Breuer family. And yet they're, they're part of the community. So a, a terrible break. They would bring in a rabbi from Hungary. Ironically, just this Shabbos, his great-grandson was davening with me in my show. He introduced himself to me. The, the, his name was... Um, Yosef Yona Harv, Yona Yosef Yona 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 Harv, Yona Yosef. I forget now. The Yonsdorfer Rav, and um, Yaakov Katz recollects what happened. You know they needed a Hungarian. You can't get a Litvish or a Polish because you need someone who's committed to the idea of Austrit. In Lithuania and Poland, they're not committed to this idea of Austrit. And also, you need a great Talmud Chacham because the general community had Dayanim who were big Talmud Chachamim. The last Dayan. Uh, in the general community, his name was Menachem Mendel Kirschbaum. He wrote the Chuvos Menachem Meshiv, two volumes. He was killed in the Holocaust. A gone Olam. Take a look at his Chuvos. But of course, these two communities were always fighting. So the, the Frankfurt community, of course, puzzled the Erev of the uh, the general community. And uh, so you, so they needed a big Tamachacham. And uh, Germany didn't produce any big Tamachacham. I mean, you couldn't get from Lithuania or Poland because they're not reliably ousted it. So you had to bring one in from Hungary. The problem is Rabbi Harvitz didn't really speak German and he was culturally is completely removed from Torim Derech Eretz Jews. So you can read how Yaakov Katz, who was in Frankfurt during this period, he describes the dispute and uh, he talks about the, the, the very first Shabbos they realized when Rabbi Harvitz spoke that uh, it was a mistake, but for the rest of his life they gave him kavod. And when I told the story over to the great-grandson, he told me more information about this because he knew it well. And uh, it, it wasn't a very good uh, shidduch, but we will uh, we'll talk more about that. Uh, and MJ Frankel says the session outbreaks more frequent in Hungary, Mamarash, and in Germany, sometimes by the Hasidim, sometimes by the Ashkenazi. We will speak about this. What I want to speak about Hungary is about the controversy over orthodox, neologue, and status quo. What you're speaking about, MJ Frankel, is something else. You're speaking about when the Hasidim, or the anti-Zionists, or any group then wanted to separate because they didn't like the rabbi, then they can call themselves Svardim or call themselves something to create separate communities. But the fundamental dispute, which is happening the exact same time it was happening in Germany, and, and actually the law was changed in, Frank in Hungary before it was changed in Germany, that allowed separatism in Hungary, uh, that created the tripartite system in Hungary of Orthodox, Neolog and status quo. I will tell you that whole story as well 
Those of you who've been with me in Central Europe, you know all about this because in, in Budapest, we go in one day, we see the three shoals, the Kazinsi Orthodox, the Rumbach status quo. It was functionally status quo, though technically it was a member of the general community. But so Rumbach status quo, it was sort of like a modern Orthodox synagogue. And then we see the um, the Duhani synagogue, the Neolog synagogue. And uh, God willing, we yep. will be returning uh, to uh, by, by the way, this summer. We're not going to let uh, Hamas deter us from doing what we do as Jews. We're going to, and the Jews of Europe, believe me, they need the chizuk. Uh, so we will go and we'll talk a lot about um, the whole situation. Now, MJ Franco, as I recall, you're a descendant from uh, the Dura V, correct? No, that's uh, David Glasner. I, Glasner. Okay. I, I, I actually have the other side of that machlokas. I'm a descendant of the Yismach Moshe. So, oh, okay. <laughs> So, in fact, my remarks are particularly uh, focused on Transylvania, the Marmarish, and, you know, the the Satmar guys are all, they're all my cousins. Okay, well, that's, uh, there's a lot of yuchas there, and uh, uh, the Ismach Moshe comes from a city, however, which uh, was a status quo city, Ujali, how do you pronounce it? You had a go to be a there who refused to Oshibar. join the Orthodox uh, community, the Divri yeah, Yemia. So we'll get to that. Privately, someone says that one of the uh, factors in not picking Rabbi Rafael Breuer was that he wrote a commentary on Shira Shirim. He wrote a commentary on Shira Shirim. He wrote two. He had to do a second one in which he interpreted it literally, uh, but in a kosher sense, that human love is also desirable in the context of uh, marriage. But that uh, became a big dispute. His opponents use that against him, and uh, look, he didn't get the, the position. Rabbi Horowitz is a greater Talmud Chacham, but Rabbi Breuer had the Yichus, he was obviously German-speaking, and he was more culturally in tune with uh, the community. Um, but uh, you can read Yaakov Rosenheim's memoir, and you can read Yitzhak Breuer's memoir, because Yitzhak Breuer sees this as a great betrayal. But from Rosenheim's perspective, the Breuers are just too extreme. The Breuers, did, when they founded a Gudasi Stroll, the Breuers wanted to put in this thing, they call it the Hungarian cause, that would have kept great rabbis out of the Aguda Presidium if they were in communities that, that allowed separatism and they didn't separate. And not just rabbis, anyone uh, could not be on the presidium. And Rosenheim thought that was too much. Rosenheim even wrote a hespade for Rabbi Marcus Horowitz, the same Rabbi Marcus Horowitz that the Breuer community regarded as basically a chote omachti atarabim. Uh, so Rosenheim thought, and he's called Morenu, the Agudas Yisrael made him Morenu. They gave him this title, and he's one of the founders of Agudas Yisrael. But uh, Rabbi Rosenheim thought that uh, the Breuers were just too extreme. He's a great admirer and lover of Hirsch, but he thought that they just, uh, they were too extreme and it led to a terrible dispute. Finally, Ellie says, I'm very familiar with this set of strange disputes. I lived it. My father was Hungarian, was from Yegesharutz, the Oberlander, who are the Yekis of the Hungarians. My ancestor on this side was the Shla Kadosh. Uh, yeah, I mean... <laughs> Hungary is interesting. We'll talk about it. And we've spoken about it a great deal before. We've spoken about the Hassam Sofer, the Kassav Sofer, uh, the Kassav Sofer, who um, was attacked by the extremists, like Raphael Lichtenstein. So we dealt with all of that. We'll come back to it. But now I think we've spoken enough tonight. I thank you all for coming out. And uh, God willing, we'll see you next week. Uh, I hate missing classes, but uh, last week couldn't be held for a um uh, Kelman is not with us because I'm back, I'm back. Canadian Jews. No, I'm oh, back. back. Okay, I'm back I was going to say he went to Ottawa to I'm do to the... Ottawa today for a rally and uh, in the snow. And we haven't had snow much in Toronto, but they had uh, 20 centimeters yesterday. So standing on Parliament Hill in the snow, um, you know, but uh, yeah, we had our rally that, uh, and I'm not exactly like the Washington rally. Obviously, we don't have quite the numbers, but anyways, uh, just got back uh, half an hour ago. So, uh, okay, good. You, uh, let me tell thing. you something. Um, so far, our president is standing strong. We'll see if it lasts. Our Secretary of State Blinken, maybe not so, but your Secretary, your president, Prime Minister, has been a uh, disappointment in some recent statements. So I'm happy that you came out and uh, made a strong uh, showing there. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, okay, we can talk about it. He has been a little disappointed. Canada's listen, Canada doesn't have such a major role on the world stage where it's decreased a lot, but that's a whole other discussion in recent years. But uh, there are a lot of strong supporters here. But you're right, the guy, I mean, we're, obviously it's not Harper anymore. For those who know the Harper years of, uh, you know, is it more pro Israel than uh, 
the Israeli government, you know, Harper. But uh, <laughs> Trudeau's been, I, 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 he could be worse. Let's say it's not the, many of the European countries are a lot worse than in Canada. But anyways, but it's good we went and then back from the rally. So, uh, you know, we're talking about Germany, German history. Germany is strong. It's stronger than America. Germany, Czech Republic, Hungary, but, but Germany. Whether the you know, tshuva they, they have to do for everything, but sh- the fact of the matter is, Germany they shut down all these pro Hamas groups that are running wild in our country and in your country. Uh, there's no freedom. There's no First Amendment in Germany. So, uh, uh, you know, there's a big, they, much bigger danger. Though they're taking like a million of the people from uh, from uh, the Middle East, and uh, we know by the po- just by the polls, we know that the majority, if not the overwhelming majority, are terribly anti-Israel, and many, most of them are anti-Semitic. So Germany has its hands full, you know, if it wants to stop all the hate speech. But we have to give, uh, you know, Hakar Satov to uh, uh, what they're doing there now to sh- try to shut this down. Yeah, yeah, lots to talk about. It was nice. I was talking to a uh, a Persian. Uh, a person, uh, you know, an Iranian, an Iranian dissident. One of them, you know, spoke at the rally. I think they had somebody like that in Washington too. Somebody from Iran. She says her family's there. They're all afraid. Most Iranians want the government overthrown, which I don't think is a, a surprise. I don't know if she knows also exactly, but all her family in Iran, they all want, uh, they all hate the government. But uh, that's the problem. If we could get rid of the Iranian government, I think the world would be a totally different place. But yes, it will. And a, the Iranian Iran is the real problem people. here. Iran is. But Iranian everything. people are good people. If you had an Correct. election, things would be different. The 100%. truth is, and the Western media doesn't want to acknowledge it. The politicians don't acknowledge it. If you had an election now in the West Bank, Hamas would win. Of course, they did a poll. Seventy-five percent of uh, people in the West Bank supported October seventh. It's like sixty-eight percent in Gaza. Mm. So people have to recognize what we're dealing with here. It's not. Uh, it's a very. It, it, it's an intractable situation here because uh, the, the the population as a whole is um, is dead set against Israel. Although in, I think the, the Arab Israelis sense. are not. The Arab Israelis, I think, are quite supportive of Israel because they know. Anyway, it's a. Uh... I don't know if they you know when they had the deals this. when they were working on this program to uh with Omer to uh they would have the border swaps. There were some Arab towns that they were gonna swap and for Jewish things, and the Arabs right. started protesting. Of course. They they don't they want to be in the house. They, they're, 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 it's freaking economically, they they would drop, you know, like a hundred percent. And also they don't want to live under the Palestinian right. authorities. So uh they have more freedom in Israel than they would under any Arab country, that's for sure. Yeah. Anyways, okay, all right, all. what can I say? But thank you. Okay, we'll see you next okay. week, please, God. And God. Uh, Rabbi Shulman and Rabbi Helfgott are back this week. They be were in Israel on solidarity mission. So Rabbi Shulman will be continuing his shir and Kohelet. He's missed the last couple of weeks. And that's three weeks, actually. Washington and two weeks in Israel. So that's tomorrow afternoon. And Rabbi Helfgott will be back on Wednesday night. Um, his shir on uh, Malachim Beit is also in Israel. Uh, Simi Peters will be back. Parsha Shir, Sitter, all the regular shearing. So, okay, everybody be well. Have a good week. Um, we hear good news and uh, bring your friends and let's learn some more Torah and let's give physic to the Jewish people and let's hope that it's Nishma uh, B'Shemayim we should hear good news. Okay, Lila Tov, everybody. Boker Tov and Israel. Okay. Tennis, okay. tennis again, I hope. Tennis, yes. Okay, good. Good, enjoy. Okay. After Vatican. After Vatican, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Very good. Lie the top, everybody.